Dablam is a jewel of the Himalaya. She stands proudly above the Kumbu Valley at 6,812 metres, guarding the approach to Everest Base Camp. Amma Dablam holds a special place in the hearts of the Sherpa people that live under her shadow. Amma Dablam means mother's necklace. Amma for the mother's shape and Dablam for the hanging glacier that resembles a necklace around the neck of Amma. Every year, hundreds of climbers from around the world take the pilgrimage to this beautiful mountain to test their skills and their resolve. This is my story. Hello, my name is Richard and I'm here in Nepal on an expedition helping to climb Amadablam. The approach to Amadablam follows the Everest Base Camp trek along the Kumbu Valley. It begins with a flight into the village of Lukla, then a five-day trek, passing through the Sherpa capital of Namshi Bazaar, before moving on to Pangboshe and up to Amadablam base camp, which will be our home for the next three weeks. Well, the Amadablam journey for me began back in 1999 when I trekked to Everest base camp. It was a two-week trek up to Everest base camp. I was young and impressionable. Um, and every day was a new day, a new adventure with new sights and new experiences. It was life-changing, I suppose, in a way. And we slowly made our way up and dealt with the challenges of altitude and, and everything else. And eventually made it up to Everest Base Camp, which was um, fantastic. It was the culmination of everything um, we'd been planning and working towards. Little did I know at the time, but we were trekking there at Easter, which just happens to be climbing season. So. Base camp was full of tents and full of climbers and um, we'd reached the end of our trip but uh, I didn't want to stop, I wanted to keep going, I wanted to join all of these people on their adventure further up the mountain. That trip was inspirational and aspirational. I pretty much set my mind to it at that point that I wanted to return someday and uh, be one of those climbers on Everest. So when I returned home to, to Britain I hung up my football boots and basically turned to climbing immediately and started learning the skills and gaining the experience that I would need to hopefully someday return to the Himalaya as a climber, not just as a trekker. And in 2009, I did return to base camp as a climber. It was quite amazing to see how far I had come in my life in, in those 10 years. Namaste. My name is Liam Suckling from Melbourne, Victoria, Australia. And uh, I've also been seduced by uh, the mighty Amadou Blam. I think I was first mesmerized by the mountain in uh, winter 2007 when I was trekking uh, up the Kumbu to Everest Base Camp. There's a moment just after Peng Boucher where Amadou Blam just stares right at you, just reaching into the, sc into the sky. It's quite, it's quite impressive. I think every mountain has a, a soul of its own, has a real character of its own, and there's something uh, very hypnotic about Amma de Blum. I think from the first moment I saw it, I swore that one day when I actually knew something remotely about climbing a mountain, it would be a real dream to return to the Himalayas and to climb, uh, to climb the mountain. So uh, yeah, four years on, I feel very lucky to be coming back to, yeah, having a shot at the mountain. This is now my fifth Himalayan season and three previous trips have been here to the Kumbu area. You just can't help but be awe-inspired by the, the shape and form of Amadablam standing proud over the Kumbu Valley. 
it's uh, it's just incredible. I remember the first time I saw it was from the Everest View Hotel, and it's just it is just amazing and a, a memory that stays with you forever. And I remember people told me that it was possible to climb it. It can't be. No one can climb that. It's it's unclimbable, surely. But tomorrow we uh, we wander up to Amadablan Base Camp, and uh, the expedition starts for real. So we'll get a chance to see for ourselves whether Amadablan is indeed climbable or not. Amadablan Base Camp is in an idyllic setting in a meadow at 4,600 metres, maybe the most comfortable base camp in the Himalaya. 26 expeditions have been allocated permits for Amadablam. There are already 15 teams in residence when we arrive, but there is plenty of space with two streams of running water running through the meadow. I think base camp is a, that's very comfortable. We've got, a, we've got our own tents to ourselves, which are permanently fixed down here for the duration of the, the expedition. So we've all got our own little private world. It's really the only bit of privacy we'll get for, you know, the whole expedition. I think one of the great things about base camp is uh, the sense of community and team that uh, is obvious in the surroundings. So, our uh, dining arrangements, there's Max uh, washing his hands on the way into the dining tent. So just having breakfast being served. Scrambled eggs. And this is inside the dining tent. Scrambled eggs, toast, lots of hot water and hot milk. Breakfast being taken. <laughs> There's our group of shepherds who are about to leave camp and go walking up, but this is the uh, kitchen tent. So we've got Temba inside. Hello, Temba. <laughs> Temba's boiling water and uh, has been cooking breakfast down here. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Temba. Hi, I'm Grace from Canada, Toronto, Canada. <laughs> Um, well, I was here a year ago climbing Lobache East and, you know, walking through the valley here, you just can't help but notice Amadablam. It's such an incredible, beautiful mountain and, I don't know, I looked at it and I just knew I needed to climb it. So, that's why I came and that's why I'm here and I'm so glad that I did it. Uh, well, I hear it's supposed to be filled with green grass and sunshine all day, <laughs> but uh, the grass is a little brown and we get sunshine for about half the day. Um, it's huge. Uh, but I think, uh, I think the weather thwarted us, really. <laughs> All right, well, this is our base camp. Let's take a look inside. We've got a tent each. Very spacious, three-man tent, basically. Plenty of room to store all of your gear. Very good. So, if you're wondering what the toilet situation is like here at base camp, here we are. There's a bit of a, it's a long drop. Won't go any nearer, but needless to say, not everybody's aim is perfect, so you have to be quite careful where you're putting your feet. Before setting foot on the mountain, we take part in the traditional Buddhist puja ceremony. This involves a lot of chanting, singing and prayers, asking for safe passage on the mountain. We offer gifts of flour and rice, the staple diet of the Sherpa people. The ceremony is hosted by a Buddhist monk, or Lama, who visits us from the nearest village of Pangbashi, two hours walk away. Sherpa climbers are typically superstitious and they are very serious about the ceremony and the importance to the expedition. But mischievous behaviour is encouraged. Clapping in the wrong place is expected and the local brew of Chang enjoyed by all. So our puja ceremony has just concluded. It's a ceremony where we ask for safe passage on the mountain. So I think it went pretty well. The Sherpas are quite happy. So we should be in for some good luck, um, some good weather and safe climbing.
With the puja ceremony complete and three nights of acclimatization in base camp, the group is now ready to start the ascent. An interim camp will be placed on terraces just below Camp 1 to aid acclimatisation. It's an easy two or three hour trek from base camp along ridges with ever increasing panoramas of the surrounding mountains. It was quite exciting to leave base camp at last and to uh, head up to ABC but it's very nice to to know that the, the mountain is waiting and to finally get a new perspective uh, on the ridge and uh, on, the, on the route that we're taking. The plan is to use the interim camp for each of the first two forays onto the mountain because the decrease in oxygen levels is too great at Camp 1 to make the full journey this early in the expedition when we're not acclimatised. <laughs> so we've made our trek up to ABC, we're about 5,350 metres. Don't have a headache yet, but certainly feel a little bit lightheaded putting the tents up. But uh, we're here, all good. Going to spend the night acclimatising and hopefully carry a load up to Camp 1 tomorrow. ABC was probably the first time that I felt uh, cold on, on, on the trip so far. It feels colder than the minus 10 degrees temperature because our bodies are lacking the oxygen required to function normally. We return to base camp for a rest day before our next load carry onto the mountain. We now start to plan our tactics for placing and stocking the higher camps further up the mountain. Some teams will use three camps, however, having now seen the Dablum towering above camp three, we are now considering making Camp 2 our high camp for safety. I just think Abu Dhabalum is visually such a remarkable mountain. It is impossible the first time that you stare at the mountain to not just be awed by its, by its presence, by its, uh, by its form. It's, uh, it's a truly stunning piece of earth. It's incredible. Yeah. It is. <laughs> it is amazing. It's probably the most beautiful mountain in the world. Well, we're now on our second foray onto the mountain. It took about three hours to get up to ABC. Last time it's certainly going to be less than two hours this time. As you can see, it's quite a lot more snow around today. It uh, snowed about probably half a foot yesterday, which worked well, being our rest day down in base camp. So the plan is to go up to camp two and camp at camp two, a bit more climatization, and then back down to base camp to rest before the first potential summit bid. So we'll uh, get to see a bit more interesting climbing as we go along. The sunsets from interim camp are spectacular, with the last rays of sunlight dancing up the slopes of nearby Malangfulang and Makalu in the distance. Well, after a fairly restless night here at ABC, we're now on the move. Normal service is resumed, so after two days of fairly bad weather that haven't really affected us at all, going up to Camp 1, which is only about an hour and 20 minutes away, and then once we get there, we'll uh, camp the night. Don't really see us being able to sleep too much better up at 5,700 metres, but it's what we need to do to acclimatise. We'll have a look at the, the route. There's a bit of easy scrambling just before Camp 1, so we'll have a look at that just before we get there. Trekking up to Camp 1 was, again, exciting just to know that we were making progress on the mountain. Uh, reaching a new altitude was great. Uh, there was a, there were some fixed ropes and uh, some slabs just towards uh, the end immediately before Camp 1. Well, here we are at the top of the uh, fixed ropes, right at 
the foot of Camp 1. Certainly quite useful to have the fixed ropes there with the ice and a bit of snow around, but good fun scramble up. So, time to get some liquid inside us to rehydrate and then just spend the afternoon enjoying the views. Hi, I'm Max Kaus from, from Argentina and UK and Brazil. I'm the uh, expedition leader, worked for Summit Climb for a few years now, and it's my third time here in the Madablan. I always say, like, coming back from the same mountain is always a different mountain. Like, I came here last year and it was totally different. Didn't have uh, as much as snow and the team was different. We had 17 people, so every year I come here is different. It's a different mountain almost. Camp 1 is on the side of a slope. There's a lot of broken rocks there, so granite. And um, it's quite hard to build tent platforms there. We usually tend to uh, lift some like walls with rocks and uh, put the tents on the top. Very nice views from there. And um, there's a big ridge, big drop to the other side. It's about 600 meter drop. John and I shared a, shared a tent and were able to uh, suspend an iPhone above us as we lay in our tent cinema and watched uh, a movie, which I've already forgotten the name of. <laughs> it was a terrible choice of movie, but it was uh, a good experience. <laughs> Well, we're now just beginning the load carry up to Camp 2. My uh, pack is far too heavy <laughs> and uh, it's pretty warm already. I need to put some zinc on to stop myself from getting burned. But um, it should be a good day. Get to see some of the interesting climbing along the route there. So let's go and get into it. Uh, probably the climb from Camp 1 to 2 uh, was my favorite part most challenging but and the most fun. The climbing basically starts from within Camp 1 itself. You scramble across boulders and then traverse an ice field up onto the ridge crest. There are fixed ropes all the way from Camp 1 up to the summit. This is our safety and protection guarding us from a fatal fall. The ropes are fixed to the mountain each season by the first party to ascend. Then they are maintained throughout the season by other groups as necessary. The cost of the ropes is shared across the different expeditions with contributions donated at base camp. The climbing from Camp 1 to Camp 2 is mainly on rock. Therefore, most climbers decide to wear trekking shoes which provide better grip feeling and dexterity than the bigger mountaineering boots. The initial climbing is great fun with easy scrambling up rock slabs with extreme exposure adding to the excitement. There are a number of snow and ice sections, however we continue without crampons, not wanting to waste a few minutes putting on crampons just for 20 metres of snow. The route continues up on the ridge crest past a couple of awkward chimneys. The climbing is exhilarating and the exposure immense. At times, it feels like you're flying or floating in mid-air. I think the movement from Camp 1 up to Camp 2 was easily the most exciting day of the trip so far. Um, the first chance to, to really use ropes and some tools and to uh, enjoy getting, uh, getting, on your, getting your hands out and actually having a bit of a climb. After about an hour, the ridge abruptly goes vertical at a rocky outcrop called the Yellow Tower. Hammer Dablin was first sighted by Europeans during the 1951 British expedition on an Everest reconnaissance trip. Edmund Hillary deemed the mountain unclimbable. However, in 1961 he did return and was part of a successful attempt that did gain the summit of Amadablam. The Yellow Tower was the crux of the route. It's amazing now to gaze at the Yellow Tower and imagine that first party there tentatively climbing, not knowing what lay ahead. Our expedition follows their footsteps. 
Uh, Yellow Tower is a very steep section, it's about uh, 18 meters of rock and um, the most technical part of the, of the climb, just like a 6A or 5 plus um, French grade, rock climbing grade. Um, people have uh, some trouble there because uh, they're usually wearing boots and um, I guess quite hard with boots that need something more grippy. You want me to sing louder? Right. So the first time we went up, I was with John, and we um, we were trying to sort of climb without the Jumar as much as possible, but the yellow tower defeated me at the top, <laughs> and uh, I ended up having to use the Jumar to, to get up the final little bit of it. But it was so much fun. I loved that climbing. That was great. Climbing the yellow tower puts you in a spectacular situation with over 200 meters of air beneath your feet. The uh, yellow tower was exciting, slightly more technical section to negotiate. Uh, so, yeah, no, it really felt like we were having a bit more fun and making some more progress on the mountain, which is very exciting. One member of the expedition, Romain Hoffman, helps to become the first Luxembourger to climb Amadablam. Romain manages to free climb the whole yellow tower, not needing to pull on the ropes at any stage, although he does attach himself to the fixed ropes for safety. This is an excellent effort at 6,000 metres on our first acclimatisation phase. The tower is graded 5.5 on the Yosemite decimal scale, which is roughly British severe and Aussie grade 13. Camp 2 is perched on top of the yellow tower. Camp 2 was really stinky, but we had an awesome tent platform in somebody else's tent. Camp 2 was uh, an unforgettable camp, certainly uh, uncomfortable, <laughs> and certainly had some pretty stunning views. Uh, five tents placed rather precariously on a tower. Uh, Sherpa certainly had some difficulty, I think, locating some sites for our tents. We cached some food fuel and climbing gear in the tents at Camp 2 in preparation for our summit attempt, meaning we need to carry a little less weight next time. Having cached our gear at Camp 2, the plan is to now descend all the way to base camp on the same day. This will aid our recovery with a night at a lower elevation and therefore more oxygen than Camp 1. Parts of the ridge must be abseiled but many sections can be down-climbed or Sherpa-wrapped. Sherpa-wrap is the name given to the typical Sherpa technique of simply wrapping the rope around your arm and lowering yourself down using your hand as speed control on the rope. It is a long day and some of the team return to base camp after dark. We return to base camp for two rest days in preparation for our summit attempt. It offers an opportunity to relax, fix equipment, wash clothes, communicate with home and mentally prepare for the challenge ahead. Certainly, it's too much time for me to think. At base camp, it's a place of waiting. I think there's some restlessness here among the members, which puts a little bit of pressure on the, on the team as we, uh, as we wait to make, a, make our ascent up the mountain. It's good to have clean clothes, especially for photographs on the summit push. But some manage to get their clothes cleaner than others. How's the washing going, Frank? Oh, the washing's going fine. I need clean clothes to land in Kathmandu, the boss says, so I'm washing my trekking clothes so they'll be clean for the airplane. Well, that's the end of our acclimatisation programme. We've now spent two days down here in base camp resting before a summit push. Been down to Pangbashir today to send some emails to family and friends to let them know what's going on and also to do a little bit of grocery shopping, get some Pringles for high camp and also some Coke and Fanta as well. So our plan from now, um, we're going to split into two teams um, and the first team heads off tomorrow. So 
um, up from base camp to camp one, spend the night, camp one to camp two, spend the night, and then summit day. So all things being well, the weather's good, and then we're healthy. Um, we then go from camp two all the way to the summit, which is about an 800 meter um, gain in altitude, and then back down to camp two, and then down um, to camp one, hopefully. And the second team will then take up residence at camp two. So we'll see what happens, but as always before any sort of summit um, push, I'm always quite nervous and there's a certain feeling of um, intrepidation. A little bit of vulnerability, um, just not knowing what's going to happen. So you just hope your body's going to be okay and the weather's going to hold and everything works out. Um, whenever you get home, there's always that feeling of bravado that you always thought you were going to make it, but uh, it's important to tape these moments of uh, uncertainty um, so you can remember and so can't really wait to leave base camp and actually get get started so I can concentrate on the, the climbing rather than just thinking about it so who knows we'll see what happens before leaving base camp I always visit the stupa to ask for safe passage and to pay my respects to Buddha in the mountain I offer some rice to the mountain and take some with me, keeping a handful in my pocket for the duration of the climb, which I will offer on my return to base camp. Well, we're starting our summit bid now. It's three days up to the top. My pack's basically empty for this trip um, up to Camp 1, yet still I've unpacked and repacked about three times. <laughs> too much time in the tent thinking about things and contemplating too much. So I'm, uh, I've left pretty early, 10 o'clock, should get up to Camp 1 at 2. Um, so I'm going to have a lazy afternoon lying in the tent, listening to music. Hopefully I'll uh, drink a couple of litres of water, and probably eat a packet of Pringles as well, and be ready for tomorrow for the uh, climb up to Camp 2. Camp 1 is in a particularly comfortable place. It's probably the first place we've been uncomfortable for the whole expedition so far. There's uh, tents pitched on all manner of surfaces, rocky and, and dicey. I settle in to Camp 1 for a late lunch and melt some snow to rehydrate. I try to relax as best I can, but my nerves are on edge for the whole four days of the summit push, not knowing how the climb or the weather will play out. I waste the afternoon as best I can, listening to music, pretending to sleep and trying not to think. I'd much rather be out there climbing and making progress, but I realise it's important to preserve energy at this lower elevation, ready for the summit day starting the next night. The summit towers above us and acts like a sundial. I monitor its progress through its elongated shadows across the valley towards Mulangfalang. As the sun drops, so does the temperature. I climb into my sleeping bag, ready for the night. We're one day nearer our objective. After a restless night, the nerves are still evident the next morning. All right, well, we'll even camp too. Right, well, we're leaving Camp 1 now on the push up to Camp 2. Got a fairly big pack. The uh, big tactical decision is whether to wear big boots or just go on runners. I've um, opted for easy runners. I've got more dexterity and it's going to be easier climbing on the rock with my sand shoes, but of course, carrying three kilograms of boots instead. Anyway, so it's only going to be about two hours up. Should get there just after lunch, melt some snow, and maybe have some apple crumble. I'm excited that uh, Summit Push is finally here. There's a bit of uh, tense energy in the atmosphere, that's for sure. It uh, feels like it's been quite a long build-up, uh, a lot of preparation and waiting for the moment to finally make our way all the way to the top. So I'm excited and, and, and ready to go. Hopefully the weather does uh, sway in our favour uh, on, on, on the day. And um, apart from that, I uh, yeah, hope we all have a, a great chance to stand on the top. The second time coming up to Camp 2 was uh, 
a bit easier to predict what was happening. And um, I think uh, it's the same with doing doing anything a second time. It's it's a lot easier, and you can you can often enjoy it more. Certainly able to settle in and, and actually look up and enjoy the views a bit more, and uh, enjoy everything that was going on around us. When climbing past an anchor on the fixed ropes, we always have one piece of gear attached for safety, just in case we slip or are knocked off. Camp 2 on Amadablam is in a constrained space, only large enough for a handful of tent platforms to be hacked out of the ice. As such, and considering there are 16 teams now at base camp, the Sirdars, the lead Sherpa climbers, of each expedition collaborate on ascent plans to ensure an optimal use of the space available, often agreeing to use one another's tents already in situ. For our summit push, we climb up towards Camp 2 behind a French team, but we'll have summit day to ourselves with the French team choosing to place a further camp on the mountain just below the Dablum. So, the uh, French team in front of us, who are with Himalayan Ascent, they're uh, a bit of a traffic jam there going up the Yellow Tower. They're taking their packs off and they're hauling the packs up. Our team unanimously decides to avoid placing a camp above Camp 2. Choosing to launch our summit bid from Camp 2, meaning a much longer and exhausting climb. However, this minimises our risk. Minimising risk is a key factor in mountaineering. The traditional site for Camp 3 is on a shoulder just below the Dablum, a hanging glacier with seracs and ice blocks. With global warming, the Dablum necklace has dropped a number of seracs in recent years and has wiped out Camp 3. So, the climb from Camp 2 will require an early start, climbing through the night and an exhausting descent all the way back down to Camp 1. But we feel healthy and strong enough to achieve this ambitious plan and ultimately this reduces the amount of time we'll be in the fall line to an absolute minimum. So, there's Grace going up the yellow tower. It's not looking amazingly yellow, <laughs> close up. And we've got John higher up on the final stretch, I think. Heavier packs today, not as easy to climb being pulled back. Okay, so here we go, yellow tower. Got a much heavier pack today. So it's going to be not as easy. The benefits of our acclimatisation programme can certainly be felt as we make our way up towards Camp 2 for a second time just four days after the first. <laughs> we can move so much easier, quicker and our breathing is far less heavy. We've left Camp 1 at 5,700 metres on our way to Camp 2 at 6,000 metres. Camp 1 has just 51% of oxygen in the air compared to that at sea level. This is the reason for our yo-yoing up and down the mountain. We force our bodies to adapt to the lack of oxygen by generating more red blood cells, in effect meaning we can carry more oxygen than we would otherwise. The lower air pressure also brings about a physiological change in how the body deals with oxygen. Nonetheless, the human race has not evolved to live at elevations over 5,000 metres all year round. So, we need to ascend and descend the mountain as quickly as possible. On the summit, at almost 7,000 metres, we'll basically be living on borrowed time. Looking down from the top of the Yellow Tower, Max Climbing up, just changing past anchors. Bit of a storm coming in, some snow. Max on the last section here. Yes, 
temporary dodge with Milita. <laughs> From the top of the main face on the Yellow Tower, it's a short climb up to the ledges where Camp 2 is placed. Looking down from the top of the Yellow Tower. Alright, well, we're in uh, Camp 2 now. Been a bit of pandemonium getting things ready. There's been uh, all the stuff that we've cached up here has been all over the place. Bad other people staying in our tents while we're here, but John and I have got the stove, well John's got the stove going, I've uh, managed to get a little bit of order going in here inside the tent, it's nice and warm with the stove, going to get some soup now and then probably some beehives later on. I don't think camp 2 and sleep are uh, synonyms by any means, it's not a, a place where, where one's body functions well, uh, so waking up at 1am to prepare to, uh, to push for summit generally doesn't actually entail waking up. I think it's more lying down in a still position, just uh, praying for the best. Well, we're just finishing off uh, our melting of snow for the evening. It's six o'clock and it's, um, it's, already, it's already bedtime. So we should be getting up at about two o'clock probably. Um, then we'll probably warm some water again and maybe go off with a litre each. I think that's all we can be bothered with. We'll uh, see you at two o'clock in the morning. All right, well, it's two o'clock in the morning. <laughs> Hello, John. We're, uh, we're all ready. So we're about to leave camp. Probably can't really see very much out there apart from a few head torches. So we'll probably not get much of a view of anything until dawn. We climb through the dark up to Camp 3. The early start gives us as much daylight as possible the next day, in case anything goes wrong. Max will explain the route up to Camp 3, with pictures shot during daylight on our descent. Our summit day is from Camp 2 and um, goes from 6,000, exactly 6,000 metres actually. Uh, all, we do a little traverse on the snow, very exposed snow ridge and that goes to a um, um, uh, couloir, uh, like a gully, we call it the Grand Couloir, it's a mixed climb and it's about 65-70 degrees uh, um, the slope to the top and then we top up a, um, a snow gully, from the snow gully we'll do a traverse and we end up on a, on a ridge called the Mushroom Ridge Mushroom Ridge starts about 6,150 6, 6, and um, pretty steep uh, both sides and big drops of both sides and um, that goes to about 6,250 where we set another camp we call it 2.9 actually and um, just after that is Camp 3 Camp 3 is kind of on, at the end of the Mushroom Ridge Having reached Camp 3 at dawn the climb continues it's quite a strong wind um, up on the ridge there just before dawn. We were pretty lucky to get to Camp 3 and uh, find a, a couple of tents to, to shelter behind. So we were there for about an hour maybe, letting the, the worst of the wind blow itself out before continuing on. And then um, from Camp 3, which is 6.3 thousand, we have a ramp, which is about 35, 40 degrees. And uh, then we touch this uh, amazing, huge glacier called the Dablan. Uh, Dablan means daughter in uh, Nepali. And um, we go on the right hand side of that. We had a lot of wind on the first day, about 40 kilometers an hour winds from west. It was pretty rough in the morning, uh, but it was okay when the sun came out. There was still quite a bit of um, wind and spin drift um, above Camp 3, but that died down um, pretty well, um, getting up towards the, the summit. Uh, I think summit day was really cold for me. I'm a bit of a baby about the cold, but I think it was legitimately freezing that day as well. And, uh, some, of the, some of the climbing towards the summit um, was a bit challenging as well, just because 
my height, I think, more than anything, and my arms got really, really tired um, going up the mountain. <laughs> I think easily one of the most uh, memorable parts of the expedition for me was in those first several hours of summer day, climbing in the dark. I mean, a lot of it was, was, was very icy. There were some really nice vertical sections, uh, lots of front pointing, and uh, yeah, really enjoyed, uh, I think it was about camp three where uh, the sun came up, stopped for a breath there before climbing up alongside, alongside the Dablam, which was uh, a really unforgettable part of the whole expedition. It was uh, absolutely stunning to see the sun come up and, and break the dark at that point on the mountain. I think there were mixed feelings uh, and challenges in those last several hours before the summit. Certainly it was excellent climbing um, and unbelievable views. I certainly felt uh, very good, uh, very positive. It was obviously there was a great day forming and it was going to be a, an awesome summit. But uh, aside from that, uh, it, was, it was some really good climbing and um, awesome. Awesome, like the final push of the summer. And after passing the Dablam, which is a six and a half thousand, we uh, go on a ridge, kind of flute slash ridge, uh, all the way to the summit. <laughs> Many people wonder and struggle to understand the appeal of climbing. Well, George Mallory, an early Everest climber and explorer from the 1920s, had a profound and candid response. If you need to ask the question, why climb, then you won't understand the answer. For me, there are many aspects that draw me back to the mountains almost every weekend. The adventure, the sense of exploration, the scenery, the fresh air and the exercise, and also the strong friendships and bonds that you build with like-minded people. The thing that stands out the most, though, is the freedom. Out there, in the mountains, you are truly free. The rest of the world just fades away and you're completely engulfed in the moment when nothing else matters but the next move. It's pure. Your whole being is right there. You are truly living in the moment. And with the help of all the fixed ropes, you, uh, you work your way up a bit of technical climbing, but it was a lot of fun. Pretty exhausting day all in all. I think it was 15 hours it took us. So pretty tired at the end of it, but um, very satisfied um, with what, what we've achieved. Nearing the summit, there is only 44% of oxygen in the air compared to sea level. The lack of oxygen is clear to see. Progress is slow, each climber needing several breaths per step. And we now just need to follow this flute all the way up to the summit, maybe 100 vertical metres. Yeah, well, summit day was certainly a lot harder and um, a lot longer than I was expecting. But um, we were all pretty strong and kept moving quite quick, so made good time, really. Those final moments before you actually stand on the summit are just something that you never forget. And they really are surreal. I mean, you can't help but spend a lot of time anticipating and thinking about that moment in the months leading up before you even commence the expedition. Certainly, uh, arriving to the summit of Amade Blanc was very dramatic. It goes from being quite vertical to seeing the ground just, you know, drop away beneath you in, in all directions. And uh, very quickly, uh, you're standing on, on, on a beautiful flat summit. Yeah, I mean, it's quite amazing. You, you get up this flute and then all of a sudden it just just levels off. So you're going up steeply and then wham, there it is, the, the flat summit top. It was uh, fantastic views. Great to, to get there and look around and see all of the amazing mountains all all around Amadablam. Uh, the summit, uh, well, can it changes every year. This year is uh, split in two. There's a big crevasse in the middle of it. And um, somehow uh, there's two summits now. <laughs> and uh, we kind of traverse from one to the other. And uh, it's pretty big and flat. When you see a mother blind and you can look at the top, it looks like the top has been chopped off. 
and uh, it's pretty big actually, it's about 100 meters from side to side and um, you can walk around and have a 360 degree view from like to all directions, you can see six mountains uh, above 8,000 meters from the summit of Amadola. It's pretty amazing. Oh, fantastic. I mean, there were moments, I think, where we all thought about turning around because of the cold, but um, getting up there, it's such a beautiful summit. It really, I don't know, I think it's maybe the most beautiful summit I've been on so far. So. Standing on the summit is an incredible experience. The physical and psychological relief and uh, elation at that, at that point of finally standing there and looking out in all directions is something very special. Almost uh, hard to believe that uh, that objective that you're, that you're focusing on and you're, you're hoping for and investing so much of, of your soul into for so many consecutive weeks has actually been realised absolutely breathless but in, a, in, in such a calm way. And I was very, very happy to reach the summit, just feel time stop. <laughs> Celebratory cigarette on the summit. It is such a special feeling to reach the objective that has been your primary focus in life for so long. The summit is such an amazing place with commanding views of Everest, Kanjunjunga and Makalu. We stand in silence in awe of the majesty of the Himalaya laid out in front of us, trying to absorb this magical moment, hoping it will stay with us for life. But you can't stay forever. After just over an hour, we regain our focus and start our descent to Camp 1. There's no point getting here if we can't get back down again. This is on the descent, Camp 2.7, well I'd say it's probably Camp 2.9. Impressive ridge, walk across it in the dark so we had no idea. <laughs> what it was, what we had a, an idea that was some exposure. I'm, uh, I'm very tired, I can tell I'm slurring my words and I can't talk. Realising that the end of the expedition has arrived it brings up some mixed feelings. A feeling of, uh, of relief that's uh, physical and psychological. Uh, it's a bit sad to, to know that it's over, as when you've, when you've achieved something that you've really wanted for a long time. Some of the joy is in, is in the wanting, is in the yearning to, to do it. Yeah, there's definitely uh, you know, bonds that will, will be left. That's always a bit sad. The connections that you build over time in such an intense uh, journey, certainly uh, ones that you don't forget. Yeah, I'm very, uh, very happy and um, proud of myself to, to get to the top of Amadabam. It's amazing when you look at it from all angles, it looks almost unclimbable. Un un Absolutely. I will absolutely be back to the Himalayas for sure. I'm not sure what's next, but I will definitely be back to climb again. Oh, from here, I'm going to South America, I'm going to Chile. Um, it's a part of a personal project I have. We're climbing all the 6,000ers in South America. There's 110, and uh, I might reach 50 of them uh, before Christmas. And then I have Aconcagua to for summit climb, and then Chile again. <laughs> The Himalayas will always be calling. I certainly like to be returning to the Himalayas next season. After that stunning view of Everest from the summit, I'd really like to to give that mountain a shot uh, in April, yeah, next year. Yeah, it, it's it's been very inspiring um, coming here and climbing Amadablam and being surrounded by so many great Himalayan giants. So I'll certainly be coming back, maybe explore a few new areas and hopefully enjoy the experience as much as I have here on Amadablam.